interview with Maria von Fersen on May 15, 1973. The interview number is 208, tape one, track one. The interviewer's name is Marlene Carnot. A part of this tape has been accidentally erased. The contents of the section are summarized in the following. Born in Estonia in 1905 as a member of the German nobility, or the ruling class of Estonia. Uh, her title was Baroness. Her family had settled in Estonia since the 12th century. She gave a short account of the German settlements in Estonia and of their way of life. Process which I did all the time, as soon as I could get away from my uh, <laughs> my um, school duties which I hated very much at that time. I was an awful tomboy. And I had my own horse, my own riding horse. Mm -hmm. how, how did you relate to the people who worked on the land? Well, it was actually a, uh, quite a, with the people who worked for, uh, like for my dad. It was a, quite a nice uh, relationship. But he was the boss, of course. Mm -hmm. So everybody was sort of, uh, you know, chapeau yeah. <laughs> bas. <laughs> How do you explain that? <laughs> it uh, changed, of course, when the independence uh, came, you know. And then uh, we were uh, disowned. I guess that's what you would call it, you know, the um, estates were all uh, taken over by the Estonian government. Mm -hmm. And uh, were you given any compensations at all? Uh, yes, a, a very uh, small compensation, but uh, not at all the, the, the market value because all the animals, you know, and the whole um, house and so on and so forth. Of course, you could take um, all your personal belongings, like your uh, furniture and, and your pictures and whatever you had, personal things, but you had to leave everything else behind. Yeah. And that almost, um, <laughs> I was, how old was I then, that time? Um, Twelve years old. That uh, almost broke my heart, because I had to leave my beloved horse and so on and so forth. How did your parents respond? To and my that? parents, of course, it was very, very hard for them because my dad was not so young at that time. He was, uh, oh, he was over fifty, I guess. And um, well, he had studied uh, agriculture and uh, had been at that all his life. You know, mm -hmm. he didn't had any um, particular skills in uh, being uh, maybe a merchant or uh, something else, um, but he's, uh, we had to move into the city and he started on that with um, another, I think it was a Dutch fellow, an import-export business. But unfortunately this Dutch fellow um, took off with money. So he was in a, uh, quite in a bad uh, <laughs> position for quite a while, but he got on to another job later on, again as uh, in the field of agriculture, so that was not so bad. Well, and we had to live in the city, which we hated as uh, children who were used to the country and so on. But it was the same for all the people who uh, had owned lots of lands, they had to step down, and that was it. Yeah. <laughs> that was the first uh, time when we had to adapt to a very, uh, very different life. And after I finished all graduate from school, I started to uh, take some uh, lessons in uh, typing and that sort of thing. And, and I worked for about one year in an uh, office office work mm. and then I married. What, were there any other alternatives than you know learning how to type and, and going to Oh work? yes there were maybe some uh, you could uh, if you were very lucky you could get into a library maybe 
or you could um, take training as a nurse or you could um, go to university and uh, well study something else but, but you, you had to have the money of course yeah. and that was the, the main trouble was there a, a strange situation to be in where you still were among the nobility yes. of the country and yet you had no money? Anymore? Yes, that was, uh, of course, um, in a way, um, sort of hard, you know. <laughs> uh, but since everybody went to, through the same. Did you still relate to the same people? Like uh, you had the same friends among your old friends and stick together? Yeah, they are all from the same uh, breed, let's say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One can call them. <laughs> and uh, of course, in, the, in Canada, you don't uh, have any titles or so, but if you go abroad, they all call you by your titles uh, immediately. What was yours? I was a baroness. So when I go overseas, <laughs> I'm so old parents again. <laughs> but uh, we knew that, you know. And How also in Estonia, it was the same. Um, as soon as they um, um, became independent, uh, they took all the titles of the uh, people. Mm -hmm. So we were without there already. Mm -hmm. But. Did people still consider you or, or relate to you as a baroness? What I mean is, yes, of course, the uh, people who are from the same, yeah. <laughs> from the same society, they yeah. all uh, relate to each other the same way. But what about the common man? You know, like uh, maybe the person you were working for. How did he relate to you? Mm, you mean now uh, in Estonia? Yeah. Well, uh, they would know perhaps uh, or soon get to know um, that I had a title, you know, yeah. and um, either they would uh, be favorable or they would be just the opposite or they wouldn't say anything, you know, they would just call you by your name without... Mm -hmm. So like you didn't feel it had any percussions in your, in your working situation, like when you were working? Well, I wasn't working with... Um, Actually, these people are now, uh, like the mer most of the merchants, were also um, German of German parentage, but they were not were not from the nobility. You know, they were uh, all kinds of uh, walks of people, mm -hmm. and uh, no German uh, people were actually um, laborers. You know, they were always in a sort of an upper upper class. Yeah. All the doctors, you know, and um, of course not all of them were um, were German, yeah. but um, in that field there were very very many, yeah. and also uh, at the universities and uh, generally in the higher positions. Yeah. How did the German get that position of control in Estonia? Well, that came through, um, I would think, the first um, time through the the years or days of the Crusades. They set out and uh, they rode perhaps on horses or God knows what, I suppose, or on some uh, boats and they went up north further and further and they got uh, to that country. And they started uh, to have uh, some kind of uh, commerce, you know, and they, maybe they got hides from these people which lived there, which were the Estonians, of course, um, like the Indians here, <laughs> and they started a trade, trade and so on and so forth, and they established themselves there. But these countries have gone through many, many different uh, stages. They, one time they were um, conquered by Denmark, and they belonged to Denmark. Then there was uh, that 30 year uh, war mm -hmm. when Sweden owned quite a bit of, uh, of Russia, that is. And uh, one time Poland uh, had these, uh, or part of these 
countries under their control. So actually, it was a, a big change over all the, all the time. But would you say that the power group remained the same, although they got different nationalities at different times? Is, is that? I think they more or less they remained the same. I would think so. Yeah. How 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 far back did your family go to Estonia? Do you do you have any? Uh, oh, that was in the twelfth uh, century. Do you trace that still? Uh, do you have a family tree? Or? Oh yes, I have a family tree, and I can trace <laughs> all that. <laughs> but I don't think it means very much nowadays anymore. It's just for my own fun, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and especially here in this country, where everything is so very, very young, and a yeah. hundred years are already God knows what, where else there are thousands of centuries. <laughs> What was your job like? Can you tell me a little bit about it? Mm, you mean in uh, Estonia? Yeah. Well, I started as a very young girl, and I had to learn everything, you know, to write letters and uh, post all the letters. That was my job. And uh, um, take uh, shorthand, uh, you know, dictations and yeah. shorthand which was rather difficult for me. I remember sometimes I couldn't read it later on. <laughs> I wrote it too fast, and so everybody was guessing. And <laughs> it was a, a sort of, a, I don't know uh, what they would call it here. We call it a pharmaceutical firm. They um, were a place where all the pharmacists ordered their, let's say, whatever they used a supply firm for uh, for all these pharmacies in the country. Did you ever consider having a career, or was it assumed that one day you would get married? You know. Well, I must say personally, uh, I didn't had enough time to think about a career because it was very difficult in our country. Um, of course, the uh, now since the, uh, the sort of leaf turned around. Everybody who was Estonian was preferred yeah. to have uh, all kinds of positions, you know, and you were sort of standing back. Mm -hmm. And uh, since my parents didn't have much money, and I couldn't make so much money, so it was very hard to say, like here you can uh, go to university and you get a loan or so, and you can uh, sort of get somewhere if you want to. But uh, that was not possible there. Yeah. It was very, very hard. And then I came upon my husband. And <laughs> How we got did you married. come, come upon <laughs> your husband? Well, I met him <laughs> at somebody else's wedding, and I married him. Yeah. And I had two daughters. And he worked for. Um, How was it to, you know, the whole courtship thing, like for proposing and so on, you know? Was it like today, dating and so on, or was it different? Oh yes, it was dating uh, was uh, fine, but uh, it was, of course, very, very different. You were not allowed to go out with uh, your date mm -hmm. alone. You couldn't go dancing anywhere. You had to have a couple with you. I see. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds so so stupid <laughs> and so funny nowadays. I mean, it's just almost unbelievable. <laughs> but that was the way it, it, it was, you know. Yeah. So you could do only these things in uh, very secrecy, you know. <laughs> did you do it secretly? Oh, yes, I did. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Anybody's young, you know. And <coughs> no, there were... Um, very special rules about all that. And of course, it, actually, nobody proposed to marry you before he couldn't give you, let's say, uh, a more or less comfortable life and at least one um, servant <laughs> who would uh, do the cooking and clean the apartment or the house or something. And actually, you were just the. Uh, Lady of uh, Leisure, <laughs> I <laughs> must say. But yeah. of course, we had a very, very 
um, busy social life. Mm -hmm. My husband was a, a person who liked to go out and who liked to love to dance and we entertained a lot and so on. Mm -hmm. So I can't say that I had much uh, time left. Was it the entertainment, was it like before before the independence? Was it the same? Yes, it was to a certain extent. It was always the same uh, on a much smaller scale, of course. Mm -hmm. But uh, generally it was, yes, to, um, a smaller way of entertaining. You couldn't, you had maybe one person who was served at the table, you know, it was, mm -hmm. all the dishes and so on and so forth. But in the old days, you had about three or four, and maybe even a, a wallet, you know, who mm -hmm. you call him doctor that way. A valet. A valet, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. Butler um, in English. Yeah, a butler, of course, yeah, that's right, yes. A butler, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, when did you have your, your first child immediately after you were married, like, you know, nine months mm. later? Or? No, I think about uh, a year after that or so. And I was 22 at that time. Did you go to hospital for, for childbirth? Or no, for the new I didn't. Wives or, or no. Like no, that was a funny thing. It, um, at that time, the, the doctors, your doctors, didn't mind at all to come to uh, your house and you had a midwife, you know, mm -hmm. and um, she came. Of course, she was. Uh, she knew the time and so on, so you could phone her, and she came, and she stayed. Just stayed at home. Mm -hmm. How long would you stay in bed after your baby was born? Oh, at that time it was very, very long. I remember. Uh, I think the ninth day was supposed to be the most dangerous day, <laughs> <laughs> for some reasons I don't know. But anyway, um, perhaps you got up around uh, the tenth day or so. And you felt terribly weak because you were so long in bed, yeah. naturally. Yeah. If you get up earlier, it just sort of helps you. Mm -hmm. I would think so. What year was it that you were married? Mm, in 1926. Well, and after, well, we lived that way until the uh, Second World War started and uh, of course then came the big big blow all of a sudden and all the people who were of German uh, heritage had to go um, to Germany and this ca came very suddenly and you had uh, actually you had no choice because uh, it was quite tricky all the, the uh, valuables, let's say, or the possessions of these German people were um, collected by the uh, German uh, government, which was very good for them. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you stayed in the country, for instance, and you refused to go, you knew that you you uh, lost everything. Yeah. And in the first place, we knew that it won't be very, wouldn't be very long before the, the Russians and the communists would come into the country, mm -hmm. and that would be the, the end of our days, mm -hmm. completely. Yeah. So, of course, uh, everybody had to go, and that was the, the hardest day in, my life, I must say, when I had to board that ship and uh, leave the country. How much time did you have to, to decide? And, and well, we had, uh, some people had only one week's time. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, uh, you were so um, completely like a uh, numb, you didn't know what to do or what to think. Mm -hmm. Everybody was walking on the streets like uh, it would be a big funeral or something, you know. People were crying, and of course the uh, Estonian people were very worried too, because uh, that is sort of the rats are leaving the ship. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and they knew that they stayed there, and uh, whatever became of them uh, was very uncertain. Mm -hmm. 
that is, they knew that um, perhaps the uh, Russians would come in and they were all this, uh, one of their biggest enemies. And about 90% of the Estonian population was uh, sent to Siberia and all kinds of places, you know. So they went through something uh, just uh, terrible. Of course, a certain percentage was survived, and they were sent there for ten years with no reason, only because they belonged to that uh, to the population. So we knew that, and so we had to go to uh, wherever they put us in, in Germany, and uh, that was a sort of a very easy way from uh, the German viewpoint. They compensated us with the Polish, <laughs> which sounds terrible, but with the um, property of the Polish people, which were kicked out from their places again. Mm -hmm. So this is sort of a vicious circle, you know. Yeah. Did you get houses that used to belong to if Polish I, people? Um, so for instance, if I had a house maybe in Estonia, I was compensated in any. Um, city in Poland also was a house. If I had land, I was compensated uh, through getting another estate or, or land or, or so, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, we knew very well what happened, you know, because we, in the first place, we had gone through that ourselves, and then we knew that um, there was quite a bit of uh, Polish nobility who were the owners of big. Uh, land and so on and so forth. And uh, to a certain extent, you, you feel related to people who are from the same, let's say, background or so. And now if uh, I have to live in their house and they have to leave behind all their um, big paintings of their ancestors and, and all their uh, lovely things which mm -hmm. they cherished and liked, you know, you feel so bad you can't uh, be happy at all. Yeah. I certainly hated it. Mm -hmm. What, what part of Poland did you go to? Well, um, I didn't go first to Poland at all because my husband had to um, remain for another year, I guess, or, or about that, in Estonia because uh, he was working, he was a bookkeeper for the biggest, um, you would call it here, the uh, government liquor mm -hmm. board. Yeah. And uh, that liquidation of um, this firm took much longer, so he stayed there for longer, and I was only with the, uh, the two girls. Mm -hmm. So I didn't go um, into Poland, I stayed in uh, uh, Dresden, for instance, mm -hmm. and went only in 1941 to Poland. Did, what did you do in Dresden? Did you have any arrangements? Oh, in Dresden, I uh, lived with my mother-in-law. She uh, lived in Dresden, and so I lived there, and the girls went to school, and um, I did the housekeeping and everything. Mm -hmm. But I didn't work anywhere. Yeah. Was it the first time you did any housekeeping? Or no, I, I always did a little bit, you know, and uh, of course, my uh, whoever worked for me, she had her two weeks' holidays, and mm -hmm. uh, during that time, and <laughs> I had to cook and do these things. Um, and I was quite proud that I could do it, <laughs> which sounds very ridiculous now. <laughs> but uh, so, when did when did you go to Poland? Um, uh, in nineteen forty-one. Yes. Was it your husband had been sent there, or? Uh, well, I was uh, divorced at that time uh, from my first husband. You know, he, he was stayed away for so long, and uh, somehow, I don't know, time worked against us, yeah. <laughs> I guess. Yeah. And um, I married uh, in 1941 my second husband, that's um, the father of my two sons. Where did you meet your second husband? Was it oh, I knew him or? already uh, since um, oh, since he went to school, I guess. Mm -hmm. So uh, he was not a sort of a stranger to me at all. Yeah. But he was in in Germany 
before the war already, I think two years or so, and he was um, a journalist mm -hmm. at that time. Well, and then I went to uh, Poznan in Poland. What I, what I don't understand is you met your, your second husband in, in Poland or in... No, in Dresden. Estonia. Oh, yeah, but like, you know, when you saw him again, when you got married. Yeah, then I met him in, um, I think it was in Berlin. Mm -hmm. I met him, yes. Well, I knew his family, and yeah. um, so we, uh, and we knew where we were yeah. in Norway. Mm -hmm. Used to write letters once in a while, and, um, and so on. So why did you go to Poland if, if your husband was in Germany? <laughs> uh, well, at that time, uh, my, uh, I got married to my uh, second husband, and uh, he was conscripted to uh, go as a um, war reporter, whatever they call it. You know, he had to write about uh, all these stories about the perhaps in the war and so on. And, um, well, I didn't want to stay uh, anymore. Also, I was al uh, always, I had very friendly relations to my um, mother-in-law. Mm -hmm. And strange enough to say also to my first husband. Mm -hmm. Even now, we're very good friends. Mm -hmm. Also with his second wife. <laughs> <laughs> and his son stayed five years here in Canada with uh, me, mm -hmm. his youngest son. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway. I didn't want to stay in Dresden anymore because um, there was no no use. My mother-in-law moved away from there. She went also to Poznan, and so I went there. But at that time, um, you had to take up a job if you didn't have a child under six months. And of course, I had two girls which were almost teenagers at that time, or oh, they were teenagers already. So I had to um, get a job, because if you didn't take um, up a job, you were um, sent to any kind of, of work, maybe, where you didn't want to go. So since I had done that um, office work, and I could type and so on, I went uh, and uh, got a job at um, was one of the university professors. And I did that for two years, I think or so, and then uh, Niels was born, my son. Maria von Fersen on May 15, 1973. The interviewer's name is Marlene Carnouk. The interview number is 208, tape one, track two. You were saying Niels was born? Yes, that was in 1943. And in 1945, we had to flee. Poland, you know, get out from mm -hmm. there, and very fast because the uh, Russian troops were approaching and everything was in uh, in a big debacle. Yeah. <laughs> so I uh, took off again. I had some friends in, in Dresden, and um, I got my mother and my one of my daughters and Niels, who was uh, about a year and a half old or so into uh, boxcars, there were no regular trains or anything, and it took us about 24 hours instead of maybe six to get there, we got there. And then we stayed there. You were saying that it was really hard. Oh, it was very, very hard. We stayed in a two-bedroom, or hardly two-bedroom apartment, 12 people, I guess, or so, all refugees. And from there I continued 
and went to um, the, um, the northern part of Germany. And I stayed there for a while, and then I went to the, almost to the uh, Danish border. And that's where um, I stayed until the um, English troops came in. Mm -hmm. you were and Lawrence was born there. Mm -hmm. You were talking about an event where, where uh, your husband heard that some place were going to be bombed. Oh yes, that was, a, that was the reason why I left Dresden, which I hated to leave, because I had my old mother, who was at that time, I suppose, 75. And uh, my younger daughter suffered polio in one leg when she was two years old. So she's always, is now and was at that time quite handicapped. And I had uh, that little boy and all the luggage, you know, and it was just in, almost impossible to board any trains. And I had to, seven times I had to change the trains. And you never knew whether you got in backwards or through the window or yeah. <laughs> or how and that was quite exciting mm -hmm. mm, but my husband had uh, listened to the um, English radio I guess it was at that time and um, they mentioned something about the uh, that they're going to bombard Dresden so he was very anxious to get us out of there but he was not allowed, of course, to listen to that radio at all, and um, in the first place couldn't tell me in words what was behind it, but I got the message somehow, and I mm -hmm. came out, and about a week after that, Dresden was destroyed. Yeah. So I was pretty lucky. What was it like for food and, you know... Oh, it was miserable. Really miserable, I must say. Um, during our, uh, I was three days on the train from Dresden to um, that part of uh, northern Germany, and you couldn't get any food at all. They had uh, on some places a kind of a coffee, which was no real coffee. It was, um, I think, made out of rye or something. So that was hot at least, and maybe you had a piece of bread with you, and uh, you uh, ate it, and you were very lucky if you, you got that. Or some places had a, a sort of a place where you could go and get a bowl of soup. But um, there were no normal communications at all, and during the night you were always afraid, and uh, you knew that there were uh, air raids. I've never been so scared in my life like that. One night I had to stay close to the, um, uh, what do you call it, to the railway, the central railway station, which was almost, uh, let's say, destroyed, but still some trains could come in. And everybody knew that that was always a target, the first one. And when we came into that, city, um, people told us, oh yes, you can bet on that, by 8 o'clock every night, you can set your watch, they come in and they throw the bombs on top of the city. Mm -hmm. So here I was with my family, of course, sitting on our luggage. Mm -hmm. And uh, what could you do? You were so scared, stiff, but you had to remain there. And luckily, in the middle, they didn't come that night for some reason. In the middle of the night, somebody shouted, there is a train going towards the direction I wanted to go. So I um, got everybody up. They were sitting on chairs or lying on the floor or so and sleeping. But I was so worried that I walked back and forth all the time. <laughs> and we got into that train and we got away. But these were the conditions. What was the feeling that you had during the war? Like, did you feel nationalistic or patriotic in the least, you know, not having lived in Germany? You know? Well, um, you know, that is a very uh, hard c uh, question to, uh, to answer properly, because I was completely against the uh, 
Nazi government, mm -hmm. as all of us were, because they, in the first place, the Nazis were against the nobility, mm -hmm. which didn't uh, yeah. please us too much, you know. Yeah. <laughs> they were just for the uh, sort of uh, for the working man, mm -hmm. and that's why they uh, they got uh, to power because they uh, bribed the. the working men with all these cruises they did for uh, into the Mediterranean and God knows where, and they had so many privileges. Mm -hmm. And um, Hitler said uh, very loudly in one of his uh, hundreds of speeches that he didn't uh, give a damn what the nobility was mm -hmm. thinking about him or doing, you know. So this put us in the first place against him. Mm -hmm. And then the whole uh, bit uh, was kind of mispleasing us very much. Mm -hmm. But of course we uh, hated the communists mm -hmm. the same. These are two, uh, mm -hmm. uh, two things which are almost the same. Uh, one is red, the other one is white, but uh, the end effect is exactly the same, you know. Yeah. And you just can't live under them. And it was dangerous, you know, because you couldn't say, you couldn't voice your opinion at all. It was very dangerous if you rode in the, for instance, in the bus or somewhere, subway, and you uh, said something, oh, perhaps the war is going to be, you know, uh, over soon, or, or the Germans are going to be beat or so. You d didn't know whether somebody was there and denounced you. And you disappeared so fast, you couldn't leave a message or anything. Yeah. So were, you, were you informed, like for instance, when the Germans started to lose territories and so on, you know? Well, of or course, uh, we were listening to the radio all the time and everybody had somebody somewhere mm -hmm. out, because everybody was uh, subscribed to, uh, to a military service, you know, from the age of 17 to, I think, you five or God knows what. Mm. So um, all the families were sort of in in the know of things, and then you heard all the news, which you didn't believe, of course. And again, you had to uh, sort of read between the lines, and then you knew, and you know, you could tell it. They they lost so much ground, mm. and they were running so fast. Yeah. <laughs> that this was uh, obvious, yeah. obvious to anybody, but uh, only nobody knew that, let's say, the Russians would come as far as Berlin or something. That was, uh, I don't think that was uh, anticipated by anybody, so that was kind of a surprise. You know. uh, what about the English, like when you saw the English troops coming in, like even if you didn't support the Nazi government, I don't, you know, I wouldn't have been very pleased either to have yes. some other army coming into. Well, of course, I mean, um, let's say we had, uh, we have the same uh, language also, it sounds, um, the difference is like between the, the English English and the American English, mm -hmm. like our German is like the, uh, maybe the, like the English and uh, the uh, German in Germany is maybe like the, the American or vice versa. It is a difference um, between us and of course we are to a certain extent different too because we always lived in a small country and we had many, many um, connections uh, with, uh, let's say, Russia before mm -hmm. the revolution and uh, with many other countries. Uh, but uh, when the English uh, came in, oh, we were very happy, of course, very happy. Right. And they came in quietly um, in that area. There was, was no fight anymore. And um, I mean, it was uh, no hard feeling or anything, because anybody was happy uh, who didn't uh, stay in in that area where the Russians came in. Yeah. But like Germany had still lost its sovereignty, you know, for a while. Like, um, didn't you feel badly about that, or, you know, were you were you really glad that the English had come in? You know, 
shoot, I mean the Allies. Well, uh, I mean, if the government, uh, the Nazi government would not be there, I would say perhaps uh, we would have liked the German, a uh, normal German government better, maybe. But since um, it was that way, and uh, besides, we didn't uh, had any hardships through uh, through the English troops. I would say maybe some people who were they occupied some uh, of their houses or the better ones and so on. Of course, they had to move out, but I mean that's not so bad. Mm -hmm. You were kind of used to that. Sir. We were uh, and we were uh, through the mill all the time, so we were used to these things, and so that didn't bothers at all. But of course we were very hungry at that time. Uh, the bad time came after the war, you know, because uh, there were no supplies and uh, but I guess we survived. And <laughs> Tell me more about that. Did you go to work then to, to you know, for your children? No, no. At, at that time you couldn't do anything. You got a, a sort of a little uh, welfare or so, mm. because you were a refugee and there was no work, work at all. Mm. And you got your, you had your ra um, rations, food rations, you know, mm. and they were not too expensive and um, I can't remember the sum uh, at that time which we got. It's so long ago, I must say. But it was very little you could buy for that. Mm -hmm. Did did any of your children have have problems of malnutrition or anything like that? Do you know? No, I think he, yes, Lawrence cried a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I guess he was a little hungry because I nursed him myself, and I was very hungry. So I bet he didn't get yeah. <laughs> much out of me. <laughs> <laughs> but otherwise, they were uh, they were okay somehow. You know, the people helped each other, and uh, the lady where I uh, roomed at that time, that is, the uh, people who lived in uh, in areas where the war hadn't been, they had to take in into their living rooms, for instance, or so refugees, which they hated, mm -hmm. naturally. Yeah. So this was a very... Uh, bad situation for all the refugees who uh, floated like into these different provinces, you know, mm. always ahead of the Russians. <laughs> <laughs> so they were overcrowded and some of them had um, all kinds of uh, misunderstandings and so on, but um, I never had any difficulty with that lady. Mm. Also, of course, you were, uh, you had to live in a, in a room where there was no heating at all. and. It was still cold, it was in April, but I guess we managed somehow, and she liked Niels very much, and she fed him sometimes, when she had something left, you know, she called him and um, she gave him uh, some food, which I was very happy about. Yeah. <laughs> and when Lawrence was born, of course, you couldn't buy any clothes or anything mm. at all. That was all on, also on uh, cards and rations, you know. So therefore, uh, the ladies of that street where I was, they collected from house to house they went and they uh, gave me all kinds of little baby things and so on. Mm -hmm. It was very nice, I must say. Mm -hmm. And that was a general way, you know, people helped each other. Because everybody had some kind of... Uh, of bad life, you know, in a, in a way they lost their uh, belongings or uh, even, uh, of course, lots of them were widows and uh, so on and so forth. When did things start to get better? Yeah. Well, uh, things started to get really uh, better after I left Germany and that was in 1954. Well, um, from that city where I was in northern Germany, I moved to Frankfurt on Main, 
that is almost in the middle of, uh, of nowadays Germany. And I started to work for the American government um, in a library as a librarian, sort of. Mm -hmm. And uh, from, I worked there for three years, two or three years, and I also worked after that in an office again as a secretary. But at that time, my younger daughter decided to migrate to Canada. And uh, she said, well, in two years you're going to follow me, which I didn't know exactly at that time. But um, first my uh, older daughter went over, and uh, in 1954, I thought it was the best thing to do for my sons, of course. Mm -hmm. For me, I knew it wouldn't be a picnic, and it wasn't actually <laughs> <laughs> to start with. But uh, for them, I hated to leave them in Europe because I had the feeling Europe is in, in so many bits and pieces, and uh, God knows mm -hmm. it might start something again. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to have them out there, from there, and I came over to Canada. Mm -hmm. And then, from um, 1955 on, things got very, very uh, much better and, uh, let's say, they're well off mm. in general. Mm. Were you sorry you left Germany? No, I wasn't because at that time I was here and um, besides uh, all my family is here, so I have no reason to, I wouldn't like to have part of my children uh, here and there is the other part in, in Germany, so it's no use. But I like to go and uh, visit Europe mm -hmm. once in a while, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so you came to Vancouver close to the Russians again? Mm, I, uh, yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> but I hope they won't have any intentions. <laughs> <coughs> or I won't see it anymore, I hope at least. <laughs> well, and here I had to start from the scratch and really work hard. I never worked so hard in my life, but I guess I uh, survived it and I still enjoy it to be here. <laughs> what was your first contact with Vancouver like? You know, how did it compare to what you'd known before? You know? Well, it was about 100% different than um, Europe, mm -hmm. which I knew already, but you can tell somebody, you know, it's 100% uh, different. But still, you don't know how different it is. Mm -hmm. In what way was it different? Well, the, the country looks different already, uh, and uh, um, the space is so very vast. Uh, you know, if you travel by train, uh, you see these. Um, oh, you can go for hundreds of miles almost uh, through country where uh, there is nobody or almost nobody can see maybe somewhere a, a house and that that you can't do in, in Europe. There's never one minute you wouldn't see three different cities at the same time at least, mm -hmm. or villages or something. And uh, what struck me, there are so many dead trees here. The first thing when I landed in Quebec and I rode it uh, to Montreal, stayed four days with friends in Montreal, and on that stretch I noticed already the dead trees which are still standing in the woods between the live trees, which would never happen in Europe, because everything is so small, and uh, it's more park garden-like instead of like here. Yeah. You know, it just remains there until they fall and they... Uh, And of course, the prairies were quite an experience. Also, I had um, some pictures uh, taken by my daughter sent to me, but still it was very, very different. And then, of course, the most exciting was to ride through the Rockies. That was fantastic, really fantastic. Well, and um, Vancouver is a city or as as it was at that time, it was very different too. 
all these little um, wooden um, buildings. <coughs> we didn't have any high rises here or uh, anything, not even any apartment houses almost, mm -hmm. because that is now how long? That's almost uh, that's 19 years. You even would know what yeah. it was like at that time, you know. Mm. Here, the West End, there were all these little wee houses on it. Mm. Were the streetcar still running? And, or? It was the last uh, summer of the streetcar when I came here. Mm. I never rode in the streetcar, but I think it, and Granville Bridge was opened. I came here on the uh, 11th of July, I think. And uh, Granville Bridge was opened just short, shortly before that, I guess. And the Cleveland Dam was built in 1954. So all these exciting <laughs> things happened when I arrived. <laughs> I'll always remember that. <laughs> Were you impressed by, by the amount of electricity around here and then the... Well, I knew the, uh, the, uh, because I had seen it uh, somewhere in, uh, you know, in picture shows and so on, mm -hmm. uh, that the uh, different flickering lights would be very, uh, very different again to the ones which are uh, mm -hmm. overseas, let's say, generally, I guess, in Europe. I don't know what they're like in, in your country, but mm -hmm. anyway, the... Uh, as far as I know, they're a little different. And here there's, uh, well, that didn't um, impress me too much, mm -hmm. I must say. I knew they, they liked very vivid colors, you know, and these big signs and so on, and everything flashing and so. Yeah, yeah. well, the thing is, uh, the, this other person I was talking to was saying that coming from Europe, you know, who had suffered yes. from the war, you know, yeah. she was really impressed by the plentifulness of food and oh, all these yeah. lights that around. Oh, yeah, that was another thing which I was very impressed. Um, and also, uh, of course, it impressed me very much that the people didn't care um, for food at all. You know, they threw the food away, mm. which seemed to me uh, completely uh, impossible because we had been so hungry that we would even go and uh, find the last little crust of bread, maybe, and here nobody eats a crust of bread at all. I don't know why, but they ate crusts. Yeah. And uh, first, I remember one time I um, went um, daily and uh, was kind of a companion to an elderly lady, and she had uh, her grandchildren next door. And there was uh, that little grandson who was uh, quite... Uh, <laughs> naughty sometimes, I must say, and if he didn't uh, like his food, he just simply took it, threw it, threw it away. Yeah. And I was not used to that. <laughs> <laughs> or the uh, lady said, oh, well, well, just shove it in the stove. She had an old-fashioned yeah. stove at that time. Yeah. Was that the first job you got? Mm, that must have been one of the first ones, yes, I guess, maybe. Well, I had to do uh, lots of hard work first. I had to, of course, go for, uh, and do day work, they call it, mm -hmm. and um, had to work about um, six days a week, and sometimes for six different ladies. I mean, uh, they were uh, all right, these ladies, of course, and well-to-do, and so on, but they were very, very uh, sort of cool, and uh, you had the feeling you were just uh, some kind of machine which was paid, but not, uh, they were not interested personally uh, into you at all. Yeah. A you very, said, very cool feeling, you know. You said you had to do, for instance, to, to uh, clean the windows, there were six Oh yes, I had to, of <laughs> course. I uh, said, well, would you like to take, uh, I don't know, this, and the next one said, well, I clean, uh, I have my windows cleaned this way, and so on and so forth. And the fifth one asked me finally, well, which way do you clean the windows? I think I, I clean it any odd way you tell me, you know, because um, every 
lady has a certain preference of uh, doing little chores and things. Finally, I got the knack, of course, of, uh, yeah. you know. But first it was very hard because uh, the whole way to keep house here is different again. Mm -hmm. And since I went for, through all these topsy-turvy <laughs> years, you know, uh, we didn't have these um, so many vacuum cleaners and God knows polishes for all different things and for uh, mantelpieces and for mm -hmm. so and so. Yeah. <laughs> did, how did, did you find it humiliating a little bit or, or something like that? No, uh, not really because uh, I mean I knew that uh, I was just a servant to them mm -hmm. and uh, that was it. They didn't know uh, what uh, kind of education I had or I didn't have. So uh, sometimes it even made me smile a, a, <laughs> a little bit that yeah. <laughs> when I saw them went uh, after I had cleaned uh, let's see, some glass tables and uh, two hours after that they went and tried with their finger if there was some dust on it or so. I thought it was very uh, petty and <laughs> <laughs> so on, but it rather made me laugh. No, I, I can't say that, but it, it was difficult, all right. Yeah. Did you find a lot of difference between the European bourgeoisie and then the American one, North American one? Because you were saying something interesting about that last night. And now the, the, the thing was that, of course, um, through my um, jobs, I had to take first. Mm -hmm. I had no contact with anybody because who was I? I was just a cleaning woman, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe otherwise, I, uh, if I could sit down with, uh, with one of these ladies uh, in, uh, in her living room and talk to her, Maybe it would have made some sense, but in the first place at that time my English was uh, even worse than it's now, and uh, I had forgotten my uh, school English, uh, and uh, it was rather difficult. I couldn't uh, have any, uh, even if they'd ever asked me, I couldn't have any conversation with them. Yeah. Was there already a Baltic community in Vancouver? Oh yes, there was. Did you go to meetings and so on? Well, that was, um, let's say, the biggest help, mm -hmm. because in, in 1948, I think, or 47, the first group of about 12 young fellows came out here to Canada. Uh, and this was through um, the field marshal Alexander. Um, he had uh, fought after the uh, First World War against the communists in um, the Baltic states. And he got to know uh, quite a few of these people from the uh, that time nobility. Mm -hmm. And they uh, remained in some kind of, I don't know, or some of them uh, relations. And uh, they approached him after the war. Mm -hmm. And so he was of a great help. And um, he sponsored so many young uh, fellows to come over to Canada. So they came over. And naturally, uh, after a year or two, they brought maybe their, uh, their parents or uh, their friends or so on into the country. and. They all helped each other, and uh, that was a real good idea, I must say. Mm -hmm. When you come and you're a stranger in a country, you, uh, of course, you go to the different places um, where um, manpower or whatever it is, but um, it is so much easier if somebody gives you a phone call and says, oh, I heard there is a job maybe in the fish cannery or in that hospital or in here or there or somewhere. It is a big help, and so we helped each other, and that was uh, very, very good. I must say, my sons had so many times uh, jobs through that sort of yeah. <laughs> private agency, which was no agency, but yeah. just through friends. They worked for uh, fellows who uh, had already their own uh, gardening, um, maintenance uh, establishments, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Did 
did they, and the, I mean the Baltic community, did you have your status as a member of the nobility or, or not? Well, actually, uh, see, uh, yes, uh, of course we, we have it, but officially we don't have it because okay. as soon as you become a, a Canadian citizen, The date is May 15, 1973. The interviewer's name is Marlene Carnouk. Interview number 208, take two, track one. Well, and in 1955, I started to work for the hospital where I stayed for 15 years in different departments. Well, that was uh, not always easy because I worked for seven years on the midnight shift because I had to, uh, of course, uh, support my two sons, which were nine years and 11 years when I came into this country. Did you hear of the job through the Baltic community too? No, I didn't. I got it through, um, through a brother of mine who had a girlfriend who was a nurse, was at hospital, mm -hmm. so <laughs> this way. <laughs> I mean, it was again, a, let's say, a private, yeah. private approach to that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. What kind of a job was it? Um, I uh, didn't have any training, of course, in any uh, kind of uh, hospital work, and I worked as they called it an aide. Not a nurse's aide, but an aide. We had to wear uh, white uniforms and shoes and so on, but no caps, of course. Mm. And uh, we had to uh, work in the central service department or anywhere. That's where I worked for for about half of the time. And we had to, um, which was very hard for me. I had to learn all the, um, let's say, uh, equipment and starting from the, um, a needle to up to uh, a gastric suction and so on in English. I never knew the, of course, none of them uh, what they would be, you know. Um, and I had to serve as a wicket where all the nurses, student nurses came to get their different things they needed for caring for the patients and you had to know what it was and some of these things had uh, two names which was uh, <laughs> very difficult first <laughs> if one came and asked you for so and so well you didn't know what it was and yet you had to be efficient and, and fast and so on um, and then all of a sudden you learned to do, oh that's the same as uh, so and so <laughs> <laughs> and you had to um, sterilize and um, how to play with all these things and trap them and so on and so forth you were telling me about this room where you had to sterilize things. Yes, it was a, a very big room and um, it was very hot at that time, generally, because there were seven huge outclaves, uh, like uh, big ovens. And um, during the day there were many, many, many people, I think as many as about 16 in that room. The room was big enough, but still it was quite quite a bit. All kinds of the head nurse was there and uh, nurses and uh, practical nurses and the aides. And a porter who was helping during the day until 10 o'clock at night, he had to do the heavy out cleaning. But of course there was some left for the night shift, which mm. I had to do then. Mm. I worked by myself during the night which, uh, not that I didn't like to work with somebody, but, uh, you know, if you have to work hard, it's sometimes easier. You just go ahead uh, and do it uh, as fast as you can, you know, instead of uh, sort of uh, doing with somebody else who maybe uh, is not 
uh, ready to do so much work or so on. And uh, another thing which I had to adapt myself very much is that um, the approach to any girl you work with you have to always be very polite, you know, and would you please, and would you like, and would you like to do it so and so for me, or something, this is the uh, approach you have to have. You can't uh, say somebody, go and empty this, or uh, take it there, or so, they, they may be offended. Mm -hmm. And if you are in a big rush, and so on, and you have to all the time take it, now you have, have to sort of uh, <laughs> say all that, uh, it was easier uh, for me sometimes. I sure worked hard, but uh, I could do it my way and uh, so on. But I had to train, we had to take turns. Um, sometimes when I was off, of course, somebody else had to take my night shift, and so I had to, to train the other kids to do that, what we did during the night. Mm -hmm. How many hours a day would you work? Yeah. Oh, eight hour shifts. Eight hour shifts. Yeah, eight hours. And what, what was the pay? Mm -hmm. Oh, I started with $140 um, a month. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, you couldn't compare the uh, cost of living, uh, which was so much lower, but anyway, for mm -hmm. three people it was very little. Yeah. I don't think we could have uh, lived on that if I, if I didn't um, take any um, borders, mm -hmm. which paid again, and that helped me to pay for the food, you know, and for the uh, for the house and so on. Did you apply for family allowances and so on? Oh no, I never did. Why not? No, it, it wasn't done at that time. It was completely different. I mean, this is 19 years uh, mm -hmm. back, and nowadays everybody goes uh, and uh, sort of stretched out the hand and says, oh, I have so many children, I can't do it, and then uh, nobody did it at that time, mm -hmm. unless you were really uh, unable to work. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the other hand, I was a new Canadian, and I came into this country, and they, of course, my daughter sponsored me. But um, I was 49 years old, and uh, who wants to have an old lady in, in the country? They let me in because of my sons, naturally, mm -hmm. because they would become new, uh, you know, new Canadians here. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had the feeling if I would go now after a couple of years and say, oh, yes, I can't make it, mm -hmm. uh, I need some assistance, they uh, could even refuse it and say you 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 couldn't become a Canadian, of course, before you were five years in the country. Mm. And uh, if you're not a Canadian, then they can just say, okay, we're not uh, willing to support you. That's mm. it. Mm. Nowadays, it's different. Did you? Ha so you had to handle both your job and night shift, and then your family. And oh yes, I had to cook for everybody and, <coughs> and do the night shift and so on and so forth. Of course, the boys took on um, paper routes and whatever was available, you know. But still, it was uh, sort of a rough going. But we had also a good time. We had a little parties in between, and mm -hmm. <laughs> I had very little sleep, and, um, but somehow we managed. <laughs> I was younger, of course, at that time, and so. What was the stratification in the hospital like? Like you were, you were saying that you couldn't call a nurse by her name. You know. Oh yes, I mean it always says here that in this country everything is so, uh, there are no uh, bosses, you know, and no uh, Indian sort of thing. Yeah. But um, as far as I'm concerned, uh, I would say it's exactly the same as in Europe too. Mm -hmm. You know, who uh, holds a, a higher position, I mean, you can't be just so friendly with that while you work. Mm -hmm. Of course, privately it's different, but uh, while you work, uh, there is a certain, uh, you have to know your place, you know, and if you uh, know your place that you're just an A12, you have to be, uh, yeah. 
Did you make any friends, like, through your work? Well, oh, yes, I still have a very good friend. Um, she's retired this year, and she's uh, a secretary with the outpatient department. And uh, I'm very friendly. It's a good friend of mine, and she still tells me everything, what's going on in the hospital and so on. Oh, and I see, um, ever so often, I run into people I know from that time on, and uh, a few other girls who worked in the same department with me. And actually, I must say, they were all, uh, all quite nice, but uh, I don't have the feeling <laughs> that too many women together are a good idea. How is that? Uh, because they uh, um, they uh, are more jealous, you know, because one has a little better position, maybe. If the other one is already mad at that, mm -hmm. so she tries to find faults and so on and so forth. And uh, they can uh, be pretty petty and, uh, and miserable. Uh, I mean, I've seen enough of that anyway in these 15 years, so <laughs> I can't say it is, uh, it's always uh, very healthy maybe, and I have the feeling that a male boss is easier uh, on the uh, girls than maybe a woman boss would be. Tell me a few of the stories that happened in 15 years. <laughs> Tell me a few of the stories that happened in those 15 years. <sighs> well, I mean, uh, I don't want to <laughs> to say uh, anything about uh, personally about <laughs> about uh, the uh, the uh, people I worked with, but they were very very different ones. I mean. Some of them had, uh, of course, I saw lots of them which were newcomers in the first place, because they worked in, in that uh, sort of position from all different countries. And there were some which were terribly frustrated. They couldn't take it and they couldn't adjust themselves in the first place. And. Um, that was quite hard sometimes mm -hmm. on them and also on you, you know, because you have to uh, sometimes go in between and uh, tell the kids, oh, she means it this way, but, you know, she's just, uh, they do things in Europe differently and uh, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And there are the ones which in the first place always um, talk aloud the, in their own language, with, which is the number one fault, you know. Nobody should do that. You can do that at home if you like to, but uh, never if somebody else is there who uh, does not understand the language. I think it's very rude and very, very bad manners, but there are lots of people who do it. And I would say, um, unfortunately, especially the Germans. And through that, sometimes there were some misunderstandings. So. Uh, I mean, if somebody talked to me in, in German, I just answered in English. And they got mad at me. Yeah. They said, you're ashamed of talking your own language. So I said, I'm not ashamed at all, but I'm not going to talk my own language as long as somebody else is there who does not understand it. I, I'm taught that this is very rude. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and these little things, you know, and so forth. Mm -hmm. You said that you appealed to the union once, the union at the hospital? Yes, uh, this is another thing. Uh, I can see that there, uh, a union has to be there mm -hmm. in order to uh, perhaps maybe protect you sometimes. Uh, I can't say that I have much luck, <laughs> luck <laughs> in that because I worked in, um, in two different departments and uh, my salary was um, not according to my work schedule in, in one department mm -hmm. and of course I got the lower pay which was uh, 
in the other department. And I fought against that for, oh, several years. And they didn't uh, do it, actually anything because naturally they only employers they're employed by uh, the hospital and they don't want to get themselves into any uh, maybe uh, hot water there. Yeah. <laughs> so therefore they tried to drag their feet and so on and so forth and finally it came through. Did you get it attracted me? And I got adjusted to the uh, mm -hmm. the upper scale which yes. Actually, because I was not so uh, opposed to even wear a white uniform to what I got paid for. Mm -hmm. And I had to handle uh, patients at that time. I had to take them on wheelchairs uh, all over the hospital, you know, and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. And if you uh, handle patients at all, you are already in, the, in a different category. Yeah. So you work both? handling patients and still in the sterilizing room? Yeah, well, that was later on when I worked with the outpatients department. Mm -hmm. um, I was there for uh, eight years, I guess, and in the emergency department. Yeah, well, it was very, very interesting because you uh, you could see people from all walks of life, and especially in emergency, mm -hmm. all kinds of them. And I always like to uh, observe uh, people, and uh, this made it interesting. Also, the work was not too, sometimes not too interesting. I had the feeling maybe I could have done something. Uh, something more, but uh, since I wasn't trained, of course, I had no chances. Mm -hmm. What kind of emergencies would you get most often? Mm -hmm. uh, you mean what kind of people? Yeah. Well, of course, all the people who uh, got into something in accidents on the streets, you know, mm -hmm. but uh, to a great deal, we got the, uh, and generally the same old drunks, you know, mm -hmm. who came in and they uh, had fallen down and had some uh, lacerations or, or something or other, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so we knew them already, the Jims and Joes and different ones who used to come in. Yeah. <laughs> but also we got uh, all kinds of uh, children in the first place with uh, knees and uh, during the summer at the beach, they, they stepped onto glass and mm -hmm. so on, or else again in the skiing season, lots of people who um, twisted their uh, ankles or even mm -hmm. had fractures and, and so on, and many, many car accidents, and lots of old people, I always felt very sorry for them, uh, who had, let's say, heart conditions and uh, were terrified to go mm, home again and stay alone and so, mm -hmm. so on, and they always um, tried to stay overnight and so on. Mm -hmm. But of course it's not uh, possible to keep anybody in, in the emergency ward because the beds are just there for uh, accidents, mm -hmm. you know. What kind of vision of Canadian society did that give you, you know, like you're talking about all these old people who have no one, you know, Yeah, that them. is uh, also something which Indian is, um, I have the feeling very different to Europe. Uh, there are nowhere so many uh, <laughs> old bachelors as in this country. And uh, generally they came out perhaps from somewhere when they were young and they worked and they made maybe lots of money and so on, but not all of them had the ability to put that money to work somewhere. And then there were these depression years, the dirty thirties, as they call them, yeah. and uh, they um, resorted to drinking and so on, and uh, drifted uh, down, mm -hmm. and uh, um, most of them live in some little crummy uh, skid road hotel. And they don't, they lost connections now, uh, there are Scottish people or Swedish people or in, from England or so, and they not, uh, lost all connections with their uh, families, and they uh, never married, and now they sit there and sort of um, wait for what, for the last day perhaps. Mm -hmm. 
You were saying something about an incident, too, of Indian people, the treatment of Indian people. Yes, and the, uh, the, that, I must say, I mean, um, <laughs> was kind of disappointing. Uh, the Indians were not mistreated, but uh, they referred to them always, oh, just an Indian, mm -hmm. you know. Or oh, there were Indian girls, of course, who came in from, uh, they were beat up in Skid Road and so on. I mean, uh, of course, you can say they got themselves into these uh, situations, but um, I think very often it, they, they are, uh, let's say it comes without their uh, knowledge of the things. They come uh, into the city from uh, God knows where, from the backwoods somewhere, and uh, some uh, fellows uh, take them sort of home when they come from uh, their construction or uh, loggings or so on, and uh, promise them perhaps all kinds of uh, things, mm -hmm. and uh, then they get rid of them in, uh, on the skid road. Well, what, uh, where can these kids go mm -hmm. if there's no uh, agency or no people who would um, try to, you know, find them and uh, so on. It is uh, very tough. Yeah. You know, like the way you're speaking about these old people and then the Indian people and so on, you know, um, and the discrimination, the differences there are in status in the hospital, you know, like what kind of impression does it give you of Canadian society? Because when you hear about uh, Canada or the states where it's supposed to be democracy and each one yeah. gets a chance and so on. Yeah. Like this seems to be completely the opposite. Well, uh, maybe I don't uh, <laughs> <laughs> relate it in the proper way. Yeah. Um, well, but there are, for instance, I mean, here is uh, in Vancouver, it's, uh, where is Snob Hill? Snob Hill is British property. Do you think you or me could go there? I mean, in the first place. If uh, you have uh, or you sport any accent mm -hmm. in the language, mm -hmm. you're immediately classified as so much lower somewhere. Mm -hmm. Never mind what your education or your background is, mm -hmm. generally. Of course, there are uh, exceptions in that too. Mm -hmm. But um, generally, I would say uh, this is already uh, the first step. Yeah. And uh, I don't think that um, people over there, uh, let's say, on that side, mm -hmm. <laughs> would ever um, invite anybody from the East End. Mm -hmm. I mean, I could say it's so far apart as mm -hmm. uh, heaven and earth. Mm -hmm. Sort of. I mean, yeah. this is, uh, uh, it is all there, and mm -hmm. it will be there perhaps, and it will remain there. Nobody talks about it, mm -hmm. but everybody knows it. Mm -hmm. What I find interesting is that you, you relate to the Baltic community on one level, yes. you know, where you are somebody, you know, and it seems that on the other level of, of the mainstream of Canadian society, mm -hmm. you, know, it, you know, it doesn't matter. You know, like you say, who am I, and this sort of thing. How did you feel about that? Well, uh, the contrast. I mean, you see, uh, I think uh, I don't feel bad at all because uh, to them, you know, I am just an ordinary uh, a person, mm -hmm. perhaps, mm -hmm. because I don't uh, have any uh, anything uh, very. Uh, visible, I don't have a house, or um, I'm not uh, a social uh, person or so, so I'm, I'm just yeah. just an ordinary person. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't bother me one, uh, one bit. Yeah. Does it matter what the Baltic community thinks of you, though? Well, uh, we know each other so well, and mm -hmm. um, They know, they, they're all the same. Yeah. You know, they have to do, um, let's put it that way, maybe inferior uh, jobs and so on and so on. But I, I don't think uh, that matters at all. As long as you know yourself where you stand, you can do any, I mean, uh, yeah. I can
can have dirty hands or I can do any kind of a job. <coughs> I still, I know who I, I am and I remain the same still mm -hmm. to myself. And that's the main thing to me that I know where, uh, where I stand. And uh, if I don't know, you know, and now uh, I would try to adapt myself to, I don't know, just a, a, a very ordinary cleaning uh, woman and I would feel so bad all the time that would be terrible mm -hmm. but people who regard me just as a cleaning woman I mean I uh, I'm ni uh, nice and polite with them but I just leave them where they are and say don't bother me at all yeah <laughs> <laughs> not at all yeah I, I mean you now I do heal my work with uh, mm. with the doctor and uh, I keep house and so on and He's very nice uh, to me, and all his family, is they are very nice uh, to me, and so on, of course. Well, that is fine. Mm -hmm. I feel very comfortable with them. <laughs> yeah, it was just I was trying to understand how important is the Baltic community to you, you know, like, in terms of uh, the social life, you know, Yes, to a certain uh, extent, uh, like uh, to to us, to the the older people, of course, um, it is easier to. Uh, I have an old lady friend here uh, who's a little older than I am. Okay, well, uh, we still know the old background, you know, and uh, so on and so forth, and we had the same kind of education and. Uh, uh, the literature we read maybe uh, um, would be sort of the same. For instance, uh, she works with the French uh, Alliance Francaise uh, here, and she uh, gives me French books to brush up my French sometime, and so on and so forth. And um, I think that uh, the uh, Baltic German people are sort of uh, a very uh, international mm -hmm. because they speak many languages and they feel at home in in uh, many countries too mm -hmm. of course they feel uh, perhaps the older ones most at home if they are in their own uh, society yeah. but i think uh, that it's very interesting to see the young people now and I don't feel funny at all if, um, I mean, they do just everything the opposite way I did, or I had to do, let's say. Mm -hmm. But uh, that doesn't bother me one bit. I try to understand it, if you know, it is just different. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you uh, try to look forward and not uh, look backward and think, it, oh, that is not done, and so on, well, You'll be left uh, alone, completely alone, you know, if you don't go along with young people. Uh, I know how strong-headed I was when I was young, you know, so I have to <coughs> remember that nowadays the kids are, are exactly the same if uh, the old ones uh, don't want to go along. Well, okay, bye-bye, you know, you leave it behind somewhere. Um, How, do you have a center where you get together and so on? Um, no, we don't. Uh, not in Vancouver here. We have a sort of a summer house in in uh, um, Hope, mm -hmm. and we uh, pay a little fee. You know, everybody pays towards that, um, and so this way there was money and they bought that. Um, quite nice uh, little house at a lake and you can go there and you as a member you pay so much uh, less you know for a week or so you can rent that I did that last year I rented it for one week's time but we have our um, social gatherings twice a year we have a so-called big dance or formal dance mm -hmm. And we had that, well, then, uh, you know, you rent a place and last uh, time we were in the faculty club at UBC, mm -hmm. which was a real nice place. Mm -hmm. 
or again in say Stanley Park Pavilion or somewhere and of course uh, there are not only Baltic people uh, mind you there are uh, everybody uh, is there uh, any Canadian can come uh, a born Canadian you know you can invite anybody there yeah. to take part mm-hmm. and that is uh, twice a year well sometimes uh, we have like uh, last uh, Saturday we had a uh, a film showing, not slides, but um, a movie mm. um, of a fellow from Germany who went um, last year back to Estonia and to Latvia, and he showed um, pictures, and that was quite interesting to see uh, these old uh, old places, and uh, also they had uh, rebuilt many churches, which were. Uh, let's say destroyed during the war and so on so forth. Mm-hmm. Anyway, that was quite interesting. But on the whole, I would not like to go back into that country at all. I'd rather keep it in my memory because, uh, you know, I'm not quite sure whether I would be too emotional if I'd go there. Mm-hmm. And again, if I go there and there are uh, so many um, Russian people in, in allegedly in the country that you hear more Russian than Estonian now. And we were always used to hear Estonian, you know, on the street. Who's responsible of organizing all the activities, you know, of the... Of these, oh, well, we have one uh, is the president here, and uh, I think for two years or so, and then they have to find another one again. And nobody likes it very much because it's just not not too interesting, but, uh, and he has two um, sort of uh, vice presidents <laughs> who, pres- yeah. if necessary, they do something for the uh, the club. What's their name? Yeah. You mean of the club? Of the president. And the well, the club is a Baltic Aid Society, mm-hmm. the Canadian Baltic Aid Society, that is, uh, called the the club. Yeah. And of course all the old people belong to it. They started it, you know. Yeah. And um, I don't think too many young people uh, are going to join it because it's, um, well, it is more for the, the older generation. Mm-hmm. Yes, for the children, for the small children. They have all this mm, out at um, hope. Uh, one uh, or two weeks for... Uh, let's see. 